take your seats. Hope you're having a great week. It's one week to Christmas. <laughs> Guys, you're gonna have to help me out. What, what, what do people eat Christmas in, in England? It's turkey. Any, yeah. any turkeyers here? A couple. English roots, clearly. Is it who's, who's barbecue here? Show of hands. Is anyone a fish Chris, kind of Christmas? Have I missed something out? Shout out if I've missed something major out. Kangaroo. Anyone here? Kangaroo. There's nothing like you eating a national animal on Christmas Day, is there? <laughs> well, welcome to church. It's really great to see you. Can we also just give uh, the Bremner family just a big welcome? We've got Pastor Tara, the children, and the wonderful kids with us. And in just a moment, Pastor Tara is just going to be getting up and encouraging us with the word this morning. But before that, we've got a few things that we want to share. But right now, hey, if you are in here for the first time, we just want to extend a very warm welcome. It's great to have you at Dream Builders today. Thanks for coming to worship with us. Uh, there's nothing better than welcoming new people to church. And one thing that we'd love to do is just place a little gift in your hand, a big thank you for coming to church, but chocolate, but also a coffee voucher you can go and use out in our cafe right after the service. And so if you are new, could you be really bold and with me right now? Just step with your hands and then the wonderful host are walking down the rows. Church, could you just keep your hand back? Yeah, church, just be welcome. That's awesome. It's great to have you here with us. You'll find just inside your bag a little card that welcomes you to church. You can, uh, if you want to stay in touch with who we are as a church, you can just simply... Uh, put your details in there, or you can even scan the QR code as well, and that will take you through to our online form. And we'd love to keep you in the loop of all the things going on in the life of the church. Well, Chantel's going to come and join me, and today is a special Sunday because we are going to take a couple of moments just to look back, throw back, and celebrate the year. And so who reckons it's a good time just to sometimes stop and look back? church, I feel like we've come a long way in the last 12 months, haven't we not? Anyone think that too? Uh, some of you in here, you know, you've been here a long time. Some of you in here are going, what am I doing in church today? I never thought that would happen, but here you are, and we're going to celebrate some stuff. And so if you can stick up the next slide, here's a, just a couple of snapshots. We had our first anointing service, which was amazing, in January. I can't believe it was this year we did double services. Remember that, guys? Remember COVID, that thing called COVID? It seems like a long time ago, but we did that. We launched our prayer team that is praying for people after the services and doing a whole bunch of other things. Also, our Accord West Homelessness Transition Parcels, which is really cool. Also, if you go to the next slide, we had, this year, we were celebrating our One Another series, and we spent a long time talking through the different One Anothers in the Bible. We spent connect group doing that and it's all about this idea of building a gospel centered community and that was such a beautiful time and just to see us as a church grow in our love for one another in our hospitality for one another and our care and kindness for one another as a community i believe we have grown together which is so good Praising Jesus for all the blessings that 
they've received and leading her to church. Thank you all for a youth team and worship team, a cleaner mind and thoughts. Uh, someone's thankful for a good job. Someone asked for prayer a couple of months back for her sister who was brought out of a mental health condition and God brought her to a better place. Someone is seizure free. Someone is praising for deliverance, praising God for deliverance and that they are feeling so light and their back and their stiffness is gone. Someone is free from cancer. Praise God. Oh.
said? Amen. Amen. Come on, give these guys one more hand. <laughs> so good. Well, take your seats. I'm going to just, uh, just take this opportunity to share a notice with you. Also, take up our tithes and offerings. You know, just off the back of all of that, we thank you for everyone who calls Dream Builders Church home and that uh, basically you're giving enables this church to continue to move forward 
and do the great things it is doing. So thank you so much. And we really believe uh, in being a generous people. And as people who call Dream Builders home, that's people that be, be, be people that continue to give into the life of the church. There's lots of different ways we can give on the screen through online banking. You can also uh, give via text giving, but also out in the foyer as well. But let's quickly bow our heads. I'm going to pray for all those who are giving into this amazing church. Lord God, I thank you. You are the God who is generous. The God who says in Psalm 23 that we shall lack nothing if we choose to trust in you. And Father God, we choose today to trust you in every area of our life, in the area of our wallets and our bank accounts. And as we put you first, we know we will never come second and we will never be without because you are a good father who gives great gifts to all those who love him. We thank you, Jesus. Continue to bless this group of people in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, one notice I really want to leave you with. Next Sunday, Christmas Day, we have got a 50-minute service that's going to be in here. We're going to have a whole bunch of fun together. And so that's next Sunday, celebrating Christmas Day together. And also, I said one, but I'm going to do two. Also, we're going to be here on New Year's Day as well, celebrating the beginning of 2023, which is going to be just fantastic as well. Well, I've definitely taken my fair share of time on the mic this morning. I've loved it, but right now I'm not the one sharing or speaking. It's wonderful to have the Bremners here uh, today and the privilege of having uh, Pastor Tara come and speak this morning. And they've just been doing a wonderful work up in Dream Builders Darwin. They've been part of Dream Builders since forever, but really pioneering that great church up in Darwin. I'm sure we'll hear some stories. But right now, could you just give Pastor Tara a big hand as she comes? Oh, thanks, Mark. Thanks, music team. Just right there. Keeping the vibe happening through the whole thing. Oh my gosh, I just threw my glasses. Did anyone see that? Just threw it across the table. Just setting up my little bits and pieces. How are you? Good? So many people who I've never met, because the last time I was in Bunbury was three and a half years ago. That's too long, isn't it? Cheryl and I are driving around and we're just seeing like all these caravans. I was just saying to Karen and Ed, seeing all these caravans, and I'm like, these are our people. This is, our, this is our life. We, we have a caravan. We actually got to travel for five and a half months this, five and a half months, four and a half months. I wish it was five and a half months. For four and a half months at the start of the year, we took our caravan and drove around the east side of Australia. So we missed WA because we've seen lots of WA, but I just thought, oh, I love, I love Bunbury. You guys are blessed. What a beautiful place to live, yeah? Darwin is also a beautiful place to live. If you can get past the extreme heat, it's a beautiful place to live. I've done it for 10 years now, a decade. How good is that? I'd like a bouquet of flowers as well uh, for managing that one. I don't know how many people have been up to Darwin. It's actually a really beautiful place when I moved there. Actually, it's cool. This, this church is very significant for me, and I think I shared this last time I was here, but it was when I was here in Bunbury when God said to me, I'm sending you to Darwin. How cool is that? This front row. So every time I come, I kind of feel like, oh, what are you going to say this time, God, you know? <laughs> and so we, we went up to Darwin, we've been there for 10 years, and it's actually really, it's tropical, and I thought it was going to be like outback saloons, horses in the street. I don't know. I'm a little bit dramatic, but it's not. It's beautiful. It's, it's nice and tropical, and for about three months of the year, the weather is just perfect. <laughs> and... And the rest is just character building. <laughs> and that's good, isn't it? Now, I send love from our church in Darwin. We've got a beautiful congregation of people. It's a lovely, lovely church. Um, I know some people have had the privilege of being up and, and seeing it and being there. But the people are amazing. You know, I just got a message the other day. And Sham was like, you should tell our church. So I was like, OK, I'll tell you. There was a friend of mine just said, her little boy, he's two, two and a half. And he'd been having seizures. and. Um, and the doctors had said he's got epilepsy and they were running some tests. And, and you know, sometimes I forget when people tell you things and you'll think I'm bad because you'll be like, aren't you a pastor or something? But I'm just a person. And people tell me things and I'm like, oh, that's awful. And I often forget to say, should we pray? 
Does anyone else, like, yeah, you just forget. And, and for the first time in a long time, I just, I said, oh, I need, I need to pray for him. So I went over and I said, Lucas, can I pray for you? And, we, and I prayed over him and, and it was really short. And, you know, he's got grandparents praying and parents praying. But it was just like, okay, we're going to pray. And then I just got a message just, just the other day when I landed in WA. She said, he just had an MRI and it's all clear. And I was like, wow. I've been hearing, you've been having stories like that. We haven't had any amazing stories like that in a while. So I thought, yeah, let's share it with you. You know, God is good. God is good. But I do want to, this is not my message, but I thought, I just want to encourage you this. God is good. And his goodness never changes. God never changes. But you know what does change? Is our circumstances and our life. And sometimes the truth and the reality that God is good doesn't feel like it. I don't know if you may be sitting here like I've, I experienced that. You know God's good. You know God doesn't change. But because of your circumstances changing, it feels like, how is God good in this? How is God good? I want to encourage you with a scripture. And David says this in the book of Psalms. He says, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And I want to encourage you this morning. If you're sitting here and you're saying, I don't feel like God's good. I know it, but it doesn't feel like it. My prayer for you is that you would see the goodness of the Lord here in the land of the living. That you would see it because God is good and you're not alone if you feel like that, believe me. Um, I, I want to share this morning a few stories. Um, I'm, December is my favourite month of the year because it's my birthday and it's Jesus' birthday so we share and I just think it's a good month but mostly because I just love presents. Anybody else? <laughs> like if someone said birthdays existed but you didn't get presents, I don't care. I don't care about a birthday. Birthdays are all presents. If you come, come to me on my birthday and don't bring me a present, I, on the inside I'm like, oh my gosh, who are you? And I like to tell people, I like, to, it's terrible, isn't it? I'm just being real honest, okay? Because we're just building quick rapport, real quick. Um, so I'm just being honest. Beck knows this about me, yeah? Beck bought me like a $200 bottle of perfume once. That's a friend. Now she's a friend forever. <laughs> all right? Good job running out actually. No, it's my, se my second one. Right. <laughs> and I like to tell people that I like gifts because every now and then if I say that in my church, by the next Sunday someone buys me a gift. Isn't that terrible? I'm a terrible person. Anyway, I love, I love gifts. I love getting gifts. I love giving gifts. I love presents. And you know what else I love? I love stories. And so this morning I thought I'm going to tell you three stories about three gifts. Okay, so I'm believing that maybe the Holy Spirit's going to come and he might talk to you however way, but this is a little bit creative because it's Christmas and I just, I love telling stories. You know, there's this quote that says, if history were taught in the form of stories, it would never be forgotten. And you would probably recognise this. I mean, when you see movies or read certain books that are based on history, say the story of Anne Frank, we remember a lot more about that awful part of history when we read it through the story of someone who actually lived it. Stories help us remember. I think it's why Jesus used so many stories to communicate. He taught through parables. He told stories so people could kind of see something, get something, and they, they learn and they remember. And so this morning I want to tell you a story. The first story I want to tell you is a story about um, an orange, the gift of an orange. I'm going to read this story. You may have heard it before, although I suspect most of you probably would not have. But it goes like this. It says, Jake was nine years old with tussled brown hair and blue eyes. And for as long as Jake could remember, he had lived within the walls of a poor orphanage. He was just one of 10 children, supported by what meager contributions the orphan home could obtain in a continuous struggle seeking donations from townsfolk. There was very little to eat, but at Christmas time, there always seemed to be a little more than usual, and the orphanage seemed a little warmer, and it was time for a little holiday enjoyment. But more than this, there was the Christmas orange. Christmas was the only time of the year that such a rare treat was provided and it was treasured by each child like no other food, admiring it, feeling it, prizing it and slowly enjoying each juicy section. Truly, it was the light of each orphan's Christmas and their best gift of the season. How joyful would be the moment when Jake received 
his orange. Unknown to him, Jake had somehow managed to track a small amount of mud on his shoes through the front door of the orphanage, muddying the new carpet. He hadn't even noticed. Now it was too late and there was nothing he could do to avoid punishment. The punishment was swift and unrelenting. Jake would not be allowed his Christmas orange. It was the only gift he would receive from the harsh world he lived in, yet after a year of waiting for his Christmas orange, it was to be denied him. Tearfully, Jake pleaded that he be forgiven and promised never to track mud into the orphanage again, but to no avail. He felt hopeless and rejected, and Jake cried into his pillow all that night and spent Christmas Day feeling empty and alone. So dramatic, isn't it? He felt that the other children didn't want to be with a boy who had been punished with such a cruel punishment. Perhaps they feared he would ruin their only day of happiness. Maybe, he reasoned, the gulf between him and his friends existed because they feared he would ask for a little of their oranges. Jake spent the day upstairs, alone, in the unheated dormitory. Huddled under his only blanket, he read about a family marooned on an island. Jake wouldn't mind spending the rest of his life on an isolated island if he could only have a real family that cared about him. Bedtime came and the worst of all, Jake couldn't sleep. How could he say his prayers? How could there be a God in heaven that would allow a little soul such as this to suffer so much all by himself? And silently he sobbed for the future of mankind that God might end the suffering in the world, both for himself and all others like him. As he climbed back into bed from the cold, hard floor, a soft hand touched Jake's shoulder, startling him momentarily, and an object was silently placed in his hands. The giver disappeared into the darkness, leaving Jake with what he did not immediately know. Looking closely at it, in the dim light, he saw that it looked like an orange. Not a regular orange, smooth and shiny, but a special orange, very special. Inside a patched together peel were the segments of nine other oranges, making one whole orange for Jake. The nine other children in the orphanage had each donated one segment of their own precious oranges to make a whole orange as a gift for Jake. Beautiful little story, a little bit dramatic, but a really sweet story that really shows the Christmas spirit. We talk about it, don't we, the Christmas spirit, this time of year, what is the Christmas spirit? This is the definition of the Christmas spirit. When you see someone who is lonely or someone who maybe doesn't have as much as you have or someone who doesn't have much at all and saying, I want to do something to bring hope or joy or life or love into that situation. You know, I love that as, as Dream Builders Church, we're, we're a church who cares about our community who cares about helping others, helping one another and helping others, not just exclusive to here. I loved hearing all the things that you guys have been doing. It's amazing. And you would see in there, there was, we also did this and we reached out here. This is the Christmas spirit. And so this year with this story, I want to encourage you and challenge you. Look out. Look around you and look out for someone who needs to experience the love of Christ, the peace of Christ that you have to give. It might be simple. It might be you, you bake for a neighbor. Maybe there's someone who's alone and you go over. My brother went to my, my grandfather's house the other day and helped him set up his Christmas tree because he lost his wife this year and that's what she always does. That's what it means to be a believer, to actually say, I want to step out and I want to do something to make someone else's Christmas year, moment, day just that little bit better. The second story I want to share is, is a story that I would probably be right in assuming that most people sitting in this room have heard. You know, when you hear a story you haven't heard, you tune in, you really listen. When you hear a story you have heard, you tend to jump ahead and, oh yeah, I know that story. And you kind of lose that fresh, like I'm hearing it for the first time, feeling. The story, of course, I want to tell you is the story of the birth of Jesus. This is made by beautiful Lani when she was in year two. And I held Lani when she was, I was the first person to hold her apart from Beck and Joel. How's that? And so I'm, Lani's preaching with me today. 
the story of Jesus being born, the Christmas story, the nativity story. Now, very often we think at Christmas time, the story starts with Mary going to have a baby. But that's not where the story starts. Many of you will know that. It's just not where the story begins. It's like telling the orange story where someone tapped him on the shoulder and then he received this orange. It's like just telling that part of the story. If you just tell the story of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus, the story starts long before that ever happened. The story starts back in the Garden of Eden when God creates man and woman. And they stand there and, and they're in this perfect environment, but they choose in that moment to do something just for themselves, to say, I just kind of want to do my own thing here, do, do it my own way take something I'm not supposed to take and they, and they take that apple and they fall into sin. Humanity falls into sin. And from that moment on, that's where the story begins and then we watch it progress. You see, when you take the whole Bible, that's what you see. It progresses from Adam and Eve and this, this problem that now that they've sinned and done their own thing and gone their own way and they're imperfect, a perfect God can no longer be in connection or relationship with them anymore. And so humanity is separated from God. And so we see all through the Bible, God working to, to draw people back to him. And ultimately, God set aside a time in history where he would rectify the problem of mankind. Where he would say, I'm going to create something that actually builds that bridge between mankind and and God himself that restores that relationship and he chooses to send his one and only son as a baby into this world. And then the Christmas story that we know and the part that we tell continues. See, a lot of people, you don't have to have gone to church or, or be a Christian to have heard the story of Mary and Joseph and baby Jesus. But the beginning of the story is the story that really matters to us. And we see Mary, Mary comes as a young, very young woman and an angel comes to her. I mean, that alone, we just say it. And the angel came to Mary. Stop. Think. Go back to the story that we know over and over again. Imagine. An angel. Can, I've often said, God, please never show me an angel. Because I just feel... Like, I would, everyone's, don't be afraid. It just must be so scary. And an angel comes to her, young, unmarried, says, you're going to have a baby. That's over, it's overwhelming finding out you're going to have a baby anyway, let alone the situation around it. And so she says, okay. And then he comes to Joseph, and you can imagine that. Stop and put yourself in that part of the story. This ain't my baby. You sure this has just come from? This has just come from God, you say. I mean, you just can't imagine being in that situation. What you'd be thinking, what you're going through. We just tell the story so flippantly. An angel came to Mary and she had the son of God and Joseph came and he took her. But really, I mean, even thinking I'm going to birth the son of God, me, I don't have prenatal vitamins, this has got to be the best pregnancy ever, I've got to like, you know, like you just... That's full on. Why me? Why? I mean, the questions. And anyway, so they, they go on this journey and they decide, okay, we're, we're going to have the Son of God. And they, and they step out. And I want to read this part of the story from the book of Luke because the Bible tells it well. <laughs> and it says this. It says, at that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. This was the first census taken since, oh sorry, that the governor of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for this census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. And he travelled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. 
And this is the part of the story where we see them go on that journey. I mean, that alone. A I, I love driving in the car on car journeys, but on foot, <laughs> via animal, via, I mean, it's hard. And they go on this journey and they get to this place and, and sorry, there's no room. Do you know, that's what it's like if you try and book somewhere in the southwest over the Christmas period. <laughs> there's no room. <laughs> there's no room. It's like, well, where are we even gonna, where are we even gonna stay? Well, what are we gonna do? I mean, imagine the innkeeper, had he have known this is the son of God, he'd be straight into one of those rooms like, you're out, these guys are in. But he didn't know, no one knew. So they provided a space and I just want you to take a moment to imagine what it may have been like for Mary to walk into a room, not even a room, no, no midwife by your side, no doctor around the corner at a buzzer, probably not even a mum nearby, just, just alone, there with Joseph, and you start to go into labour to birth a baby. The pain, the fear, hoping that everything's going to work out all right. <coughs> when we remember the story, we just, Mary and Joseph, they went into the into the barn and they birthed the baby and there he is. Yeah, that takes time and hard work and pain and effort. And that baby, Jesus, would have come into the world crying and cold and she wraps him up and puts him in the manger. This is the story that we remember at Christmas time that Jesus came, God himself came to our world that was desperate and needing a saviour. You know, Jesus didn't just, he wasn't just a one gift for one time. He wasn't just the one who came just for the people of that particular period of time. He came for all of mankind, for all of eternity, for every person that would ever walk on this earth, he came for. He's the ultimate gift that keeps giving. Have you ever had a gift that keeps giving? I don't know if anyone's ever seen the National Lampoon's Christmas vacation, they always show it on Christmas Day, right? Christmas night. My brother-in-law's obsessed with it. We have to watch it every year. It's painful. It's not my humour. It's not my humour. And he doesn't get his Christmas bonus, right? And what he gets instead is this gift that keeps on giving. It's the Jelly of the Month Club subscription. That's his Christmas bonus. Every, <laughs> every month he gets a different jelly, you know, the gift that keeps on giving. Jesus is not jelly, but Jesus is the gift that keeps on giving. It keeps coming every month, every day, every minute. Because he didn't just come to bring you salvation, he also came to bring you hope. He also came to bring you light when times are dark. He came to bring you peace when your life feels like it's in turmoil. He brings it today. He brings it for the moment you're going through today. He brings it for what you're going to go through tomorrow. It keeps coming. It's not a once-off, one-time. It's the giver who saw the ultimate need and came to satisfy that need and all needs to come in the future. The third story that I want to share with you, the third and final story, comes from... My favourite Christmas carol, Little Drummer Boy. It's hard to pick sometimes, isn't it, a favourite, but that's, it's my favourite. It's because one year I stopped and I looked at, I looked at the lyrics and I looked at the story. It's fiction, right? It's a creative, you know, ride, riding around, the ba around Jesus. But, but I don't know if there was actually a drummer boy that was, you know, by Jesus. But it's my favourite carol, and you know, I married a drummer boy, and it drives me nuts, because he taps everything. Anyone else? Okay, we've got some, they're getting it. Oh, you people can't keep your hands still. Oh, and now my eight-year-old is also really good timing, she's really good, and Sherwin's teaching her, and I'm like, I swore I'd never marry a drummer, but I did. So anyway, this little drummer boy, when we look at the lyrics in this carol, it tells a really beautiful story. It starts like this. It says, come, they told me. And it's this little boy telling the story. And he's saying it from, come, they told me. It's the kings, right? It's the kings coming and saying, hey, come, come. Come, they told me. A newborn king to see. 
Our finest gifts we bring to lay before the king. Probably like the perfume you back bought me. The finest gifts to bring <laughs> to lay before the king. So to honour him when we come. So this little boy's noticing these kings are saying, we are bringing our finest gifts. You also must come and bring your finest gifts to the king. You've got to see for yourself. And the, little, and the words go like this. It says, I am a poor little baby. I am a poor boy too. I have no gift to bring that's fit to give our king. I have no gift to bring. You know, the drummer boy in these words, when I read it, I went, that's me. That's you. We might think we have some fine gifts to bring to God. We, we have no gift to bring to a God who gave absolutely everything when he gave Jesus. We have no gift to bring. It's like, I, I, I have no gift to bring. And if I compare to this person who does all these amazing things for God, maybe that's their gift they're bringing, and I don't have anything to bring before Jesus. I don't have anything to bring before the king. But this little drummer boy goes on and says this, Shall I play for you on my drum? Now, I'm a mum, okay? I've got four beautiful daughters. When they were babies, if Jensen came in and said, Hey, can I play my drum for your sleeping, sleeping newborn baby? I would be like, no, you cannot. <laughs> but it says, Mary nodded. The ox and lamb kept time. I played my drum for him. I played my best for him. Then he smiled at me, at me and my drum. It's why it's my favorite carol, because it's just this beautiful story of what it feels like to understand the gift that Jesus is and feel like you have nothing to offer back to God, nothing to bring, but understanding that all I have is this. This is who I am. This is what I have. And so I guess, Jesus, if I just bring you this, will that be good enough? And I just love that one line. Then he smiled at me. I mean, he, he's a baby. A newborn, it was gas, you know. <laughs> he really smiled. <laughs> but you get the point in the song. Then he smiled at me. There's this sense of this pleasing nature that Jesus as a baby, as lovely as it was to bring the finest gifts to him, it didn't really matter to him because what matters to Jesus is that we come as we are, nothing special, nothing extra, just as we are, saying this is who I am and this is what I've got and I'm going to bring that to you, Jesus, this Christmas. And let me tell you, it's all he wants. It's all he wants. He doesn't want anything fancy. You don't have to get everything clean and good and right. He just wants you to bring what you have. See, we miss the words in this carol sometimes because there's so many pum pums in the middle and you just think that's what the song is. But every time you hear it, I want you to picture yourself going, I have no gift to bring. This is it. It's just me. And so my encouragement to you this Christmas, remember the story, take some time to sit down and really play it over again. Not just hear it or read it briefly, but take it all in as if you're hearing it for the first time. And then come before him and say, I bring you myself. Psalm 95 verse 6 says these words, Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. That's what we're to do this Christmas. For those who have chosen to follow Jesus, our king, to surrender their life, to say, I give, this is what I have and I give it to you. Christmas is the time for us to bow down in worship and kneel before our Lord and maker. Not just celebrate that he came, but offer a sacrifice of praise, offer our life in worship. A man named uh, Italio Calvino said these words, and the pianist can come, says, it is not the voice that commands the story, it is the ear. 
You know, I've shared three stories today. But it's not the voice that commands the story, it's the ear. It's not about what I've said, it's about what you're hearing, what you're taking away. See, when we look at this story of Jesus, the story itself or who it's told by is not what makes it the greatest story. What makes it the greatest story is how you hear it and how you respond to it. Because the story changes your life. The story changes your future. The story changes your story. If you let it. But people can tell you the story over and over again. But it's what you receive. You see, God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's why it's the greatest story ever told. Because mankind started down a path that separated them from God and God gave a gift that brought humanity back to him. That's the power of the story. That's what makes it the greatest story. And for those who who come to church, who follow God, you know, you know this story. At Christmas time, we just remind one another, hey, let's not forget. We want to bow down and worship our King. Let's not forget what it is that God actually did. That's, That's really all I want to do this morning is remind us, hey, let's remember to worship. Let's remember to bring what we have. Let's not hold back because we don't feel like we're good enough or have enough. Let's just surrender our lives afresh. But maybe you're here and you've heard the story, but it's not the greatest story because you haven't really responded for yourself. You know, any day is a good day to find Jesus as your saviour, not just as a baby in a manger, but as the one who can bring you to God, the one who can restore your relationship and connection with God. Any day is a good day, but I tell you what, at Christmas, there's something sacred about remembering why Jesus came, that it was for you and it was for me. So maybe if everyone just wants to close your eyes, I don't... I don't really know how you do things here, but I just want to give people a little bit of just privacy and time to just think for yourself, you know, not be distracted and just think. And maybe you want to, as your eyes are closed, you want to just remember the sacrifice Jesus made for you in coming and giving his life. And maybe you want to sit there and kind of re-surrender yourself to him this morning with honour and with worship. But maybe you're here and you're saying, I want to know Jesus, not as a baby in a manger in a story, but as a saviour, as the light to my darkness, as the hope to my hopelessness, as the peace to my turmoil, as the saviour to my need. And if that's you, I want to give you an opportunity. Maybe you just want to put your hand just in the air. No one else is looking around. It's just me that's going to see. And maybe someone at the back, because I think they... They want to give you something. If that's you saying, hey, yeah, I want to acknowledge Jesus, not just as a baby in a Christmas story, but as a saviour, someone who connects me to God. If that's you, why don't you just put your hand up right now? God, we thank you this morning that you saw the needs of humanity, that you didn't leave us on our own, but you chose to rescue us. You chose to send Jesus for us. And I pray this morning that we would get a fresh revelation of what you did to restore your relationship with us. Help us to remember not as a story but as the life-changing gift that you are to our lives. And so, God, we surrender afresh this morning. We come as we are. We come with what we have in our hands.
we say, have your way be glorified through my life. In the name of Jesus. Amen. That's fantastic. Thank you so much, Tara. Let's give her a great hand. If the team can come and just get ready. We're just going to finish with a, just a song and sing a carol, carol of our own, Oh Come All Ye Faithful. Um, so why don't you just stand to your feet and just a couple of things I want to let you know about. Right after the service, if you want anyone to stand with you in prayer for any situation going on in your life, please come on down the front. They're here to stand with you and believe with you and encourage you as well. Remember to pick up your kids right after the service and we can't wait for next Sunday, Christmas Day. It's going to be a great celebration. Praying you all have a great week. But right now as we just lift up this song of worship and this carol, how about we just choose in this moment, we're going to reflect on that wonderful gift, that incredible gift. And right now it's just simply going, God, I come as I am right now. And so thankful for all you've done on this Celebrate Sunday. Thanks, team.
church. We hope you have a fantastic week. Don't forget to pick up your kids. And we'll see you next weekend for Christmas Day.